Everybody, it is Friday. Thank God it is Friday. TGIF, Pastor Blake here with you via video through social media. Every Friday for some time since this COVID uh, pandemic has come upon us in America, I've been taking time every Friday to try to post a video. These videos have um, two guidelines. A, they're about Jesus and uplifting people. And the second guideline is they're relatively short because we live in a very busy world. And I understand, uh, you know, we don't have time just to stop. And we got to go to work. we got to help with the kids. we got to help with our parents. We uh, have to check our phones, check email. And, you know, there's a lot of things grabbing for our attention in modern society. And I understand that. I really do. So that's why I try to keep the videos from no longer than 10 minutes, and they're usually about 3 to 5 minutes. Today, I'm giving you a heads up. This is, I don't know how long it will be, but this will be a longer video. And I'm telling you that because um, I've been studying. This is actually a question that started as a Wednesday night Q&A that we've been doing at Fairview. I'm taking part of it and adding some to it. It's a topic I really want to express today. It's a topic uh, as a pastor and as a teacher and several things, people ask me this question all the time. And because of that, I really want to take time to answer this question in, in hopes that it would make us stronger Christians and improve our faith of that manner. So this will be a longer video, so you need to take time. If you really want to watch this video, you need to take time to watch it and go through the scriptures with me, grab a, a pen, Grab some paper, grab a pencil, maybe a highlighter, grab your Bible that you study with. Take time, set time, uh, you know, to quiet the world, either as a personal study or a study with your spouse or your family, and really take time for this. And this is not the new normal. I will likely go back to short videos next week. Short videos are fine. Um, I understand that. I, I won't be doing a long one all the time. Uh, I gotta preach a sermon this week anyway, so you know this is kind of like a second sermon. But I've already kind of got a lot of the groundwork uh, from the Q and A style service we have been doing on Wednesday night. Another thing is, um, I've been slightly convicted uh, by the Lord and His Word. Um, not that TJF is a gimmick. I don't think it's a gimmick. Uh, but sometimes I press myself to be. I overemphasize maybe in preparation on the time and so much sometimes I pick my Bible topic to fit the time and to fit TGIF and that's all well and good. I'm not saying that I should just be boring and preach three hours and that's godly and what God desires but what I'm trying to say is there's also just power in God's Word. God's Word is what brings us to life. God's Word along with the Spirit revealing it, making it a living word, is what shows us our sin. And today, that's what I want to do. I just want to unleash the Word of God. I, I want to share, not what Blake thinks, I want to share the Word of God with you. And, and what we're going to be looking at, again, is a question I hear so often. Did God choose me, or did I choose God? Dealing with, did God predestine me to be saved? Or do I have complete free will and I have chosen this all on my own? That's the question I want to look at. Now, this is a question uh, that has been raging for a very long time in Christian thought, okay, in theology debates. Um, I'm not going over this question because it's cool trivia. You can press your friends. You can walk up and talk about predestination and man's responsibility and to impress somebody. This is not to impress anyone. Okay, I'm not going over the topics, the, the almost paradoxical, uh, paradoxical, <laughs> paradoxical, do I finally get it? Um, polar opposites. Let's say that's easier to say and most people know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> Two topics that are Polar opposites, that God chose us before the world, but yet in my moment of decision, I choose God. I'm not going over this because it's 
some kind of cool trivia. Not because it's a fringe topic, you know. It's something people debate about, and it's not just something very simple. So, you know, it, it makes you sound cool when you talk about it, you know, and it's one of those really deep questions, and people think you're really smart when you talk about it. And not why I'm going over this today. Not at all. Uh, not because it's trivia, not because it's to impress people, not because it's one of these deep, uh, questions that we will wrestle with until we meet God in His true presence in eternity. Um, I'm going over this question because, uh, and looking at this debate of these two polar opposites, these two ideas that seem like they are completely whoop, like magnets that push each other apart, um, because it involves the gospel. And that's truly where my heart is. My heart is in the gospel. We live in a world that needs the gospel. You don't, you don't need TGIF. You don't need me. But you need the gospel. And the way I'm going to try to address these two topics today, and then the, the compound question of did God choose me or did I choose God, it addresses the gospel and principles of the gospel. And, and not only that, but it, it affects the church in the way that when I address this, not only does it show someone who maybe is lost uh, how salvation works, but it also, if you are saved, it empowers you. This discussion about predestination and man's responsibility and how they're opposites but work together, it, it is not just to be something that people who go to school for theology sit and talk about and argue with each other like it's politics. It's meant to empower the church and it's meant to show God loves the world and God has prepared something for the world. And if there's anything we need in the world today, it is a clarified gospel an unempowered church. And that's why I'm going over this topic because this topic is a means not only to answer a question, but it is a means to get to an end. And the end is the spreading the gospel. The end is making God's people more equipped and more knowledgeable to stand against temptation, to stand against their own failures, to stand against the world and do what God would have us to do. So, I've already been talking for seven minutes. <laughs> um, so, this how this is going to work is I'm going to give it a very brief introduction, and then I'm going to go into a word study, like a word construction. So I'm going to be looking at the word predestination and give you some words that are associated with it. And then we're going to go into a very brief, I mean like two-minute discussion of topic history. Why is the debate between the emphasis and importance of predestination and the emphasis and importance of man's choice. Why is it such a big deal? Why, why do churches and denominations almost not speak to each other about it? So we'll be talking about topic history. Then I'm going to give you script, what, scriptural evidence uh, for the claims that are being made. And then the big thing is, once I've shown you all this, a spiritual purpose. What is the purpose of predestination? What is the purpose of us choosing God. So those are the things. So that's what we're going to do. Word construction, topic history, scriptural evidence, and um, spiritual purpose. Let me start off by saying before we even get uh, into the word construction, I said I'll do a very brief introduction. Um, this is basically um, the summary of a sermon I listened to plus some of my own thoughts and reflections. So I'm going to give you the link so you can actually listen to this yourself because mine will definitely be shorter than the actual study you know, I listened to. Um, and I'll put in the link. It's by Dr. Bob Udley. And you can check that out if you want. Much more referencing, much more debate there. Um, so, you know, Blake Bivens is not coming to you with anything new. This debate, as you're soon to find out, is almost 2,000 years old. I'm not going to tell you any kind of new revelation. not going to tell you anything new. I'm just trying to clarify what's already been said. I stand on the shoulders of giants, men that have gone before me, done much more study, including Dr. Bob Utley, whose sermon I'm basically summarizing and add a few of my things. I want to give him credit for this. This is not um, not Blake Bivens. I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I also stand in need of the Holy Spirit. 
He is the one who leads and guides us in all things. Uh, all the teachers before us, all the teaching we do, the Holy Spirit does that. Uh, so, again, this isn't for you to think how cool I am or how smart or whatever. But, again, just um, to give credit where credit's due. Other great teachers before me, other great students of God and the Holy Spirit, uh, we give him props. Okay, so when you talk about predestination, what you need to learn, first off, it is not determinism. Uh, determinism is not a biblical word. It is a philosophy. And it's a philosophy in the sense that every little aspect of history has been pre-planned before the world was ever made. So in a sense to what cereal you would eat tomorrow and the socks that you're going to wear and how many times you go to Kroger and this week, all that is pre-planned. And humanity is nothing but a puppet show and God is the puppeteer. That is not what predestination is. Predestination is not this determinism that everything has been determined to the smallest detail to how often you brush your teeth in life. <laughs> um, that is not what predestination is. So to get an idea of what predestination is, uh, I want to quickly go over some word origin. Uh, I hope that you know that when you read your Bible... No matter what translation you read, that is not the original scriptures that you're reading, okay? You're not reading an original scripture, regardless if it's King James, regardless if it's Holman Christian Standard, regardless if it's ESV, NIV, um, New American Standard. Those are all just English translations, and, and all of them almost are improved translations of another translation. So I want to look at the original words, and in the New Testament, that's Greek, okay? So when you look at the Greek word that they saw and then translated into the English word predestinate or to predestine, um, the Greek word uh, is a compound word from uh, two smaller words. So we have two small Greek words that come together to make a big Greek word, and that's where we get the idea of to be predestined. Um, so the Greek word breaks down into to set something down and before. So set something down and before. Uh, you could combine that to say to set the boundaries of something beforehand. So when you talk about the word, when we talk about predestination and that word that was pulled from the Bible and translated into predestination or to predestine, it's talking about setting the boundaries of something beforehand. So how something will work, it's framework beforehand. Um, predestination is associated with God's foreknowledge, and that means knowledge before, and God's like election to pick something out of, so to pick something, to elect it. Uh, so election, foreknowledge are associated with predestination. And in context, when we're talking about predestination, the boundaries that, is, that are being established beforehand or the boundaries of salvation. So before the world was ever made, God set the boundaries that he would have to call individuals, and then he called individuals to believe. What did they have to believe on in his son? And then that human faith element. So again, the boundaries of salvation have been set before the world was ever created. The boundaries of salvation would be that God has to call you, and he has to call you to see the realization of the works of his son and your need of them, and then, after he's called and revealed this to you, that you have to have personal faith. That is predestined salvation. That has been pre-made. That has been set out beforehand, the boundaries of it. Um, so that's the word construction. Okay, I see I'm moving quick. I'm already through the introduction of the word, word construction. Um, that's the word construction. Um, Let's talk about kind of the church history behind this. Because anytime you talk about predestination, there's going to be a giant uproar. Oh boy, is there going to be a giant uproar. There is going to be a fight. Did you choose to be saved or did God predestine you to be saved? Can you even know if you're saved, if God picked you? How does that work? There is a roaring debate about predestination versus human will. Like, do I have a choice? Do I have agency? Do I, do I get to pick, okay? So, first off, you need to know that this debate, like I said earlier, is over 1,700 years old, okay? So it's getting quite old. It is an old debate. Um, nothing new on my, I'm not gonna tell you anything that hadn't already been said, okay? Um, I guess you could say all this started about 300 years after Jesus, so, 
roughly 300 years plus after Jesus, the early church fathers made no mention of it. There was no great debates of predestination versus man's will. and It was just kind of a silent issue. Um, nothing was made of it. But until about 300 years plus after Jesus, um, there was a heretic who came along who basically said, um, you know, man has a will, but it was a will to the extent that it completely destroyed the Bible. Uh, like, you know, the man is the master, God is the servant, and that is not biblical no matter where you fall in your theology. And Augustine stepped up, who is a ancient Christian writer, and he defeated this heretic, but in defeating it, there became this really um, critical, this radical, radical is a better word, radical emphasis on predestination because he was so trying to dismiss this heretic and his writings to do so, there began the stirring of this a great emphasis on predestination. And the idea, and you may have heard this before, may be new to you, that God picks some to be saved. And because he picks some to be saved, well, therefore he must pick some not to be saved. So salvation is not even an option you have. Either God picked you to be saved, and there's nothing you can do about it, or God picked you not to be saved, and there's nothing you can do about that either. And you could say, well, that's not fair. Well, Augustine would say nobody deserves salvation. Okay, so nobody deserves it, so if some get it and some don't, it's something we wouldn't have anyway. And that would be his idea. So the radical, heavy predestination theology started with him and his rebuke of this heretic who needed to be rebuked. Um, obviously, this predestination um, emphasis, heavenly, inf heavenly, heavenly, <laughs> people who are with it, <laughs> would we'll say that, but heavily influenced Martin Luther and John Calvin during the Reformation. And of course, the Reformation was from 1517 to 1648 AD. So again, that's 1300 some years after Augustine. Uh, so they were heavily influenced by this. And it's almost a bad word in Appalachia. Uh, but Calvinism, being a Calvinist, is always associated with predestination. Uh, John Calvin was heavily influenced by radical predestination uh, theology. So um, people who are heavy on that are often accused of being a Calvinist, even if not, or uh, being Presbyterian or, or whatever, um, of the, the Reformed theology school. Uh, and that comes from John Calvin gets uh, associated with that because he clearly, like John Calvin was a skilled teacher, okay? He was a great man of God. A and predestination is so associated with him because he taught it so clearly and so many people understood it and took off and ran with it. So we started with Augustine and it has went down to uh, John Calvin and Martin Luther. And then this is where the fight starts, okay? So you see where radical predestination has started, um, that God picks some and God picks others uh, not to be saved, okay? The, this, this million will be saved, and this 80 billion is not going to be saved. Um, this idea started 300-some years after Christ, developed in the Reformation. But then we have a cat called Arminius. <laughs> That's his last name. Arminius challenged this radical predestination theology. Um, he challenged Calvin's followers. John Calvin was already passed on into glory, if he was predestined to. <laughs> uh, John Calvin was already gone. He was already in his place of reward for his service to the Lord. And Arminius uh, was challenging his followers, which to be said, the followers of Calvin kind of took his ideas and cranked them up a couple of notches, okay? So the real emphasis of predestination even goes further with his followers than him. So ever since Arminius stood up to these people and said, no, man has a choice, man chooses, man has a will, man can reach out to God, man can know God, this idea that God does all the picking and we just live it out, you know, that's not true. Uh, but Arminius did the opposite, okay? The, these other people were so tied to predestination, 
to rebuke that and trying to balance biblical uh, presentation to the masses, he overemphasized man's choice. So what you have really when people fight about predestination and they fight about man's choice is they're fighting about an overemphasis on two radically different but yet related ideas. Uh, both of them are right in their biblical context. The Bible talks about predestination. The Bible talks about man making a choice, a man having faith. The problem is because we're Western thinking people and we think that we have a point and then we prove said point, that is not true. And what I really want you to realize coming from this conflict that's been going on and Calvinism versus Arminianism, both of them fail. Both of these schools of thought fail because they overemphasize one thing when these are meant to be kind of like guardrails. Um, guardrails keep you in the middle of the road, right? Keep you going. That's the same thing with biblical truth, especially when the truths seem to contradict each other. The Bible doesn't contradict itself because it can't make sense. The Bible has these uh, paradoxes of um, predestination, yet man having a choice to keep us in the middle, that we wouldn't fall either way. It's not that one's right and I need to be over here, or one's right and I need to be over there. I need to be in the middle. Okay, they're guiding thoughts. So both these statements are biblical truths. It's folly to pick one over the other. You have to pick both. Well, Blake, how can both of these work? Well, <laughs> um, let's get ready to look at some Bible verses, okay? Let's look at some Bible verses. I want to give you several scriptures, all right? Several scriptures. I'm not going to read all of them, but I want you to read them in your own personal study, okay? In your own personal study. Um Scriptures that prove predestination. So now we are moving from, I've given you an introduction. I've told you the word forming, um, the word construction. There we go. Uh, how these words were made. Predestination means to basically in Greek set the boundaries of something beforehand. We're talking about the boundaries of salvation. God set salvation up that he has to call um, we need to see our need for Christ, and then we have to have faith. That was preset before the world began. Uh, we have talked about how the church within itself, instead of holding both of these truths up, the church has uh, fought one another on two things that are both true, and picking sides when we need to stay in the middle. Now I'm going to show you uh, some scripture that I, what I said is not a lie, that both these things are biblical uh, ideas, biblical truths, or biblical statements. And then we're going to try to put them all together, okay? So the first thing I want to prove to you is predestination is a biblical concept. It is a biblical truth, not just an idea, but it is a biblical truth. Scriptures for predestination are as follows. Feel free to pause the video in and out as I read these. We will be looking at two of them, uh, but there are several. There's even more than this. If you go listen to the original by Bob Butley, you can find it. So uh, Romans 8... Romans 8, 29 and 30. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians 1, 4. Followed by Ephesians 3, 11. Ephesians 3, 11. Um, John 15, 16 is a predestination verse. What I like about it is Jesus says, You have not picked me, but I have picked you. <laughs> you guys think you found the Messiah and you're cool. You think you found the Savior and you're cool. But let me tell you, you did not choose to follow me, but I chose you to follow me. That's John 15, 16. And then Acts 13, 48. Acts 13, 48. So Romans 8, 29 and 30, and that last one, Acts 13, 48, are the two scriptures I want to read to you very briefly here to show you what I'm talking about. Acts 8, verse 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, he also called. Whom he did call, he also justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. So we start with being predestined. Okay, so that's before before the world is ever created, okay? And then glorified is the end of that. Well, if you know anything about your Bible, glorified is the state of a Christian after the world is over. So what God is saying is, is he had a plan for us 
as believers that he's already seen it all the way through. It was it was set up before the world began, and he has seen that it will be carried out until after the world is over, as we know it. Okay, so that's a good scripture for that. Uh, Acts thirteen is another one. I just want to brief, briefly show you that God chooses, God calls. He has to do these things. All right, Acts thirteen. Verse 48, Acts 13, 48. And it says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And now listen to this. This is the part I want you to listen to. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were, it didn't say all, but it said as many. So we have there an idea that God has predestined. He has chosen. He has called. God will call whom he wants to call. Uh, and the boundaries of that, the first boundary of salvation is God has to call. You cannot seek God on your own. He has to call you. He has to reveal to you sin, reveal to you Jesus Christ. He has to make the first move. God has to make the first move. I think that's something we can establish here. All right, so scriptures that man has a choice. Okay, I've given you scriptures uh, for predestination. Let's look at scriptures for man's will. Okay, John 3, 16. That's an easy one. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That what? That whosoever believeth in him. It's not that uh, the way I love how Bob Butley says this. He changes it to, to make it sound silly. John 3.16 doesn't say for God so loved the world that if the elect believe in him. John 3.16 says for whosoever. Okay, so that's a good one. But what I want you to look at is also John 4.14 and John 5.40. Um, do it on your own time. I'm not going to read those to you right now. But look up John 4.14 and John 540. You can pause the video and do it or do it later. But where I want to redirect you back to Romans and uh, we're going to look at Romans 10 this time. And what I think is so cool about this is in Romans 9 you get a great chapter about predestination not only in a salvation uh, context but a uh, <laughs> God's just going to be God. I like to say it like this in cha uh, chapter 9 of Romans uh God says, I'm the potter, you're the clay, get out of my way, I'm going to do what I want. Uh, but then Romans 10, we get the complete opposite of that, and that man has a choice. So Romans 10, I'm going to read verse 4 to you first. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay, So Christ is the end to who? Who, who gets to accept Jesus Christ into righteousness? That, that the law is no longer the means of this, but Jesus Christ, who, who does that? Oh, for everyone. Not just the elect, for everyone. And then we go, stay in the same chapter, verses 9 and 11, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, see here, uh, who's doing the action? Okay, let's go to grammar class here. Who is committing the action? We're not talking about God committing action here. Verse 9, the subject, um, I know it's in a clause, but look, subject of that clause. Thou shalt confess. Who is confessing? The person. The person is making a choice to confess. They're making a, to confess with their mouth that Jesus, and if they shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. So if you make a choice to believe in Jesus, you make a choice to confess him, you make a choice to uh, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says Thou shalt be saved. So yes, God is the one who has to initiate, but it is up to us to answer that call. We do have some responsibility in this. Um, let's continue. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now look at verse 11, same chapter. For the scripture saith, Who so ever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So there we go. We have whosoever. And then I want you to jump down to verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, we see this element of anybody. Anybody can call. Anybody. If the Lord has knocked on your heart, anybody can call. Okay? 
anybody can call. And then we again see the emphasis of action. They call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? Uh, a, a negative to show you this, and I think negative scriptures are good to show you people who choose not to follow Christ, is in that same book. Go to verse 21, talking about Israel. Um, but to Israel he saith, All day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient, gainsaying people. I don't know how you can not say man has some kind of I'm not no I'm not trying to say there's an overemphasis on man's response, uh, but there, there's a fragment of it at least because look verse 21 says that God has stretched out His hands. He is calling Israel back to Him through Jesus Christ, and they're not coming. Why are they not coming? Because they don't want to. Disobedient. They're not doing what they're supposed to. They're supposed to choose and take God's offer of Jesus Christ into salvation, not just for Gentiles, for all. But they don't want, they're not saved because they don't want to be saved. They choose not to be. Ha. Huh. Great truth of the Bible. Okay, so I, I've given you scriptures, and there's many others that you can find. Cross-reference those. Uh, but I want to show you some scriptures that bring these two almost completely opposite ideas together. And I'm almost finished, okay? Those three scriptures that I think clearly bring these out, and again, a lot of this is to the study of Bob Utley and other men before him, so um, Blake didn't come up with all this, okay? Um, I'm just kind of summarizing it because I have to talk for almost 25 more minutes to be at the length of the sermon than which I, I originally listened to. Uh, not going to be the case here. Um, so some scriptures that show that these two almost opposing truths combined, um, some scriptures you need to look at. We're going to read one of these, but three scriptures. You can find Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which if you count 10 is my favorite set of scripture in the Bible. Uh, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, and 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 10. So Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, and then 2 Peter 1 and 10. Um, let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. All right, so Ephesians, I, I'm going to go ahead and go. If you need time to find it, pause the video. Okay, pause the video, get there, and then unpause it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 For by grace are you saved through faith that not, of your, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God Not of works lest any man should boast Okay so let's break this down The first part of that for by grace Prepositional phrase right <laughs> A big one for by <laughs> For by grace What is grace? Well that's predestination that God would make a move. We don't deserve God to move. We don't deserve God to show us salvation. So again, predestination is there. For by grace are you saved. So we're saved because God has called us to be saved. He has set the bounds of salvation that he reveals. Who does he reveal? Jesus Christ and our need for him. That's already set in stone. It's God's plan. If, it, if God don't call, it don't happen. Okay? But for by grace are you saved. Now look, look at the next prepositional phrase. Through what? Through faith. Through faith. So here we see these two almost warring ideas come together, okay? God has to call, but you, you need to answer, okay? He has predestined the way in whom you will be, in whom you will be called, Jesus Christ. He has predestined the ways that it will happen. He knows if you will or not, okay? He has foreknowledge, but you have a fragment choice here. Nobody gets saved unless God calls them, but once he calls, and he knows what you'll choose, but he's allowing you to choose. Well, Blake, what's the difference? Okay, I can know as a teacher kids that are probably going to get a good grade and a bad grade, but still they have to make the grade, okay? I can tell by their work ethic what they're probably going to get or their ability or if they memorize things just from me lecturing or talking. I can know how, what grade they'll probably get, but they still have to do it. Same thing. Not Foreknowledge is not determination. It just, you know what's going to happen. 
So, that's a good scripture to show how they both work together. So, what is the function of predestination? Now we're coming to the close of this video. What is the function of predestination spiritually? What is the function of man's will? Well, the first thing is that you've got to realize is, although Arminius was a good guy to stand up and say, God, just don't throw people in the hell to show he's God, uh, he said, uh, going back to the church history when he uh, pushed against Calvin's followers, he said man was not totally affected by the fall, that man could still sense God and see God. Well, the idea that we have to be predestined to an extent that God has to set all this up means that if he didn't set it up, it wouldn't happen. So sin has deeply affected human beings, that God has to be the provider, the one who does the first move. He has to do the calling, the convicting. Uh, fall has affected mankind in a manner that humans cannot reach God by their own means. Um, granted, that push against the fall of man happened more after Arminius and his followers more than him, but it started there. Uh, so it shows us that humans are, we're like fish in water when it comes to sin. If God doesn't wake us up out of sin, we'll just keep swimming in it and think we're good people. Um, the second thing, gr grace alone. Predestination shows grace alone but to the five solas of the Reformation. Uh, grace alone. We are saved by God's grace alone. We live in a world where everybody acts like you're doing everybody else a favor and it's by their works and by their efforts and what they do. And even religion, you know, uh, how many apple pies we bake, how many cards we send, how many times we call somebody, that's what a pastor judges off of. And, and, or you're judged off of. How many times you go to Sunday school, how many times you go to church. All those things are reflections of God's grace in your life. Because if God don't call and if God doesn't set a plan, it don't happen. For by grace alone are we saved. And here's the big thing. Predestination is not something we use in evangelism, okay? You know, when I'm trying to win somebody to the lost, I don't go up and, and to them and say, uh, win somebody from the lost, okay? Not win to. That sounded bad. <laughs> uh, win somebody to Jesus Christ. I don't go up to them and say, are you predestined? Does, what does God know about your choice of salvation? I don't do that, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> kind of silly. Predestination is to strengthen the believers. Once you're already saved, once you, once you have accepted Jesus Christ, once you've come into the fold, once you've made your choice, then we get this idea that there is security and encouragement and humility, security that God, God has preset this. Satan cannot change salvation. Satan cannot change our foundation. The world can't change it. Those that oppose Christ cannot change it. God has predestined it. If we believe it, there's nothing that's going to change it. Nothing can take us out of our Father's hand. Nothing can take us out of the hand of Christ. And it's encouragement. Not only am I secure that I'm going to make it through this world with Jesus, but I can get out there and fight the good fight. And man, in 2020, if the church needs to wake up and do a good fight, we need to realize we are predestined. This is God's system. Nothing's going to change it. You've already bought into it. The system's not going to fail. Go out there and live it. And it's humility. Keeps us in check to realize this is not about Blake Bivens. It's about God. He's the one who started this thing. That's why I'm preaching God's word to you instead of doing a three-minute video. It's all fun. And how can you be happy in your life in three steps, in three minutes, a three scripture reference completely out of context? Okay, I don't do the last part, but everything's got to be in context. Uh... Context is key, said my crazy college professor. Uh, all right, so that's the function of predestination. What is the function of man's will? Well, by faith alone. Um, another other one of the five souls of the Reformation. Faith alone. Okay? By faith alone. God has to call and you are saved by... Go back to Ephesians 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. You will not do one thing to earn heaven. I, I don't... It does not matter... How many people you invite to church, doesn't matter how many social justice movements you get involved in or how many hashtags you put on your status. I don't know what you're actually doing in your life to help other people, but I see a lot of hashtags for both sides, so you know that must be good for something. <laughs> Republican, Democrat, whatever. A lot of people are claiming to help. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, anywho, uh, being a Republican, being a Democrat, being a good person, being a good parent, paying your bills, giving the charity, works don't cut it. God sets the plan and you buy into the plan. That's it. 
That's salvation. And not only does uh, the function of man's will say by show us the importance of faith, and, and you know, again, I'm going to borrow from Bob Utley. He, he says that faith is the hand that reaches out and grabs the gift that is salvation. God's the one who created. God's the one who offers. But you have to reach out and receive it by your faith. Uh, if he don't create it and don't offer it, you're out of luck. Um, anywho, besides from faith alone being important, it shows us God loves all. Man has a choice because God loves everybody. You know, I guess you could say the predestined person is Jesus Christ, and through him all of us have a system that is, the boundaries of it are set, and God has allowed us to choose to some extent uh, because he's woken us up. You know, you just woken you know, you know, are you woke? <laughs> woke up out of your sins. Uh, that sounded cheesy. Probably a Christian meme someday. Okay, so quickly, conclusion. Um, again, Jesus is the chosen man. He is the elect man. He's the one who all things are predestined through. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 is all about, okay? Um, and remember, we're talking about set down beforehand. That's what predestination is. It's not a determination where everything to what socks you got on right now, you're just a puppet and God's a puppeteer. Not what the Bible teaches. That is not a biblical truth. Um, God's, he knows, but he, it's not that he controls and makes us do things. He knows those things. He knows how many times you brushed your teeth in the last month, but he's not the puppeteer that made it happen. Um, so, and then two statements, my own personal reflections. I'm just going to read these and I'm going to be done because I'm already at 40 minutes. Uh, God's sovereign, the, uh, God is sovereign, okay? And God's sovereign will cannot be stopped. However, it is his will that humans must choose to place their faith in his gracious revelation and gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Let me break that down for you. You know, so many people that are heavy. I love the sovereignty of God, man. It makes, I face my day. We got problems at our house. We got bills. We got things. I just say, God's sovereign. He's in control. He knows what's going on. I love the sovereignty of God. But what irks me is when my brothers and sisters in Christ who love the sovereignty of God say, well, God can't leave things into uh, man's hands because that he's not in control anymore if he does that. He's in control if he decided, who are you to tell God that he can't make this wonderful plan and he's the one that has to offer, but he gives one sliver of choice to people. Who are you to tell him he can't do that and still be sovereign? He can. He chose to do it. He chose. Well, it doesn't make sense. Sovereignty means he controls everything. Yeah, he controls everything, and he has controlled for us to have a choice. Last thing. This plan cannot happen if God has not chosen the framework and to, conducts the plan himself. Predestination. But God has predestined the plan that he has made as he's chosen Jesus. He's chosen that he has to graciously offer by his grace. And he's chosen faith. He's chosen Jesus. He's chosen grace. He's chosen faith as his means of revelation and actions. So again, it is a predestined plan, but the plan is Jesus is the only way, God's the only one going to offer it, but your faith is included in that. And he has set our faith in his actions and calling and necessity. You have to believe. You have to believe God has predestined this plan. You have to believe that God saw you and saw the moment when he would reveal this unto you and predestined you to meet the man, the truth, the revelation of this Jesus Christ. He foreknows your answer. But it is your answer to give. God bless you all. This has been an extremely long video. TGIF. We'll do this every so often. But my heart was really just heavy. I try to answer some of this on Wednesday night. I just ran out of time. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Friday. Hopefully see you at church. Furrows. The Furrows will be at Fairview Christian Community Church Sunday morning leading us in worship. I start the attributes of God, God's character, Sunday night. <laughs> I won't be preaching on that until January. God bless you all, and have a wonderful weekend.